Welcome to The Storytellers, the radio show and podcast that features those who choose to leave their mark on the world through the art of story. I'm your host, Grace Salmon. I look forward to our time together today. Now, let's meet our storyteller. Elizabeth Sumner Waffler is an author of four novels, each one in the category of evocative women's fiction. She is a member of the Women's Fiction Writers Association, where she previously served as the Director of Craft Education. She leads Evocative Publishing, LLC, and Four Eyes Editorial. Elizabeth lives in that sweet spot in Carolina between the beautiful mountains and some of the country's most beautiful beaches. If you're looking for her, you can find her at her blue desk at a farmer's market looking for fabulous heirloom tomatoes, or perhaps practicing yoga and enjoying a pretty cocktail. Maybe not at the same time. <laughs> Elizabeth, thank you for joining me today at the Storyteller's Microphone. Thank you, Grace. I'm delighted to be here. I've been following your work for quite a while, so I'm really honored that you would come and spend time with me on the Storyteller's oh, Microphone. My honor. Tell me about what does evocative, female, evocative women's literature mean? Um, when I um, first was developing my branding and I wanted, you know, the line that goes under my business card and I um, texted my first editor who knew my work very well and I asked her what one word described my writing best and she came right back with evocative. Um, you know, bringing to mind, recalling time, place, memory, sight, sound, images. Um, and that's what my gift is really in writing. Um, that's how, you know, my prose is, is full of evocation. So then um, I named my, um, I named my blog that um, has now gone by the wayside and named it evocations and it's so funny because it's on my business card and some people when i hand it to them they'll look at it and they'll say oh they'll, they'll look at me like oh because they're thinking provocative and i'm like no 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 it's evocative and then a lot of them you know still don't know what that means but <laughs> Well, and, you know, and those of us who are lovers of words certainly get that sense that it evokes all the things you say, but also emotions, right? Very strong emotions come through yeah. when I think of evocative. And you don't shy Thank away you for from putting that. that in there because that's what women's fiction is all all hinges on is the emotions. Yeah. Well, it does. And, you know, we've just finished Women's Fiction Day in June. And one of the things that was interesting to me was actually our definition of women's fiction, which is a character that changes substantially from beginning to end. And so it really is a journey. And you capture that certainly in each of your no novels. But let's just talk right now about Topanga Canyon and everything that it evokes. It's a mother-daughter story. My um, elevator pitch is um, proper... Um, proper mother, um, proper candy empire heiress, dare O'Day, has never done a reckless thing in her life. Or so her version 2.0 estranged hippie daughter, Caroline, believes. So we have Dare, who is 45 now, and she's living in quaint Foxfield, Virginia, a fictitious town. All of my books take place in fictitious Virginia area, a one area pretty much. And her daughter um, ended up after they, they've had this, you know, troubled relationship. Um, she was, Dare was a single mom, no spoilers there. Um, but she was distant with Caroline, and later we find that her grandmother, Caroline's grandmother, and Dare's mother was also distant with Dare, and uh, she was the Candy Empire CEO. Her name was Taft Marston, and she went by Taffy. And a candy empress, which is fabulous. Yeah. And so uh, Dare le leaves this frugal life and she's a uh, features editor at the local newspaper. But her daughter, Caroline, um, chose to go to college. They lived in D.C. at the time. And when 
uh, Caroline was going off to college, she chose to go all the way to USC in Southern California to, um, you know, pretty much be on other, the other side of the country from her mom. So now we have this geographical estrangement and then the emotional estrangement. And Dare is um, just so fraught with emotion about wanting to get to know her daughter, wanting to know who she is, wanting to share her life with her now that Caroline is 27. And she a, a bit of a scandal happens in Dare's community in which she is implicated. And no spoiler again. And she is thinking about, you know, the first thing she wants to do is get out of Dodge. So she ends up having the temerity to call Caroline and ask if she might come visit. So Caroline's world in Topanga Canyon is this vastly different world. They're millennials, five adults who live together and two little boys. And they live together in intentional community in a a bungalow that um, belonged to a reclusive former movie star. And they're not exactly sure which one, um, but they, you know, have added on to it and they made it. Um, it's really boho. And the, all of the, all of these millennials have their own remote day jobs that they do from their computers, but they also have a baseball field. Thanks to our, my character, uh, Parker, who was a former baseball player. They um, raised their own food. They had this riotous jungle of garden of flowers and vegetables and um, pretty, uh, there's some wildlife. Um, let's, let's say that a snake makes an appearance. Um, and so Dare goes out there and she decides to pretend that she is like a journalist and she wants to explore and bring to the rest of the world um, the life of intentional community and what it's all about and why um, people choose to live in intentional community. I don't want to stop you right there because in so many ways, our own books parallel each other. You cool. know, I, I love that there's a mother daughter issue. Um, my characters also live in intentional community. And I'm wondering <laughs> if there is something about uh, women of our age, if you will, you're younger than I am, but I wonder if we, were you creating a world that you wanted to exist in developing that? Um, no, but my daughter actually um, is a bit of a version 2.0 hippie and lives in intentional community. <laughs> okay, so we write a little bit about what we know. One of the sure. things in your book that was very powerful for me was your message is how, and I wrote it down because you said it so well, how mothers and daughters and the power to influence generations to come. Yes. Is that a consistent yes. theme through your books? Um, it is because, well, I can't, I, can't, I don't want to spoil it, but, um, well, don't spoil it, but okay, there's I, I something that's happening, a powerful message. Something huge is happening in Caroline's life that she's dealing with. And, um, if she and her mom don't get back together and begin sharing their lives, it would influence another generation. Is that too spoily? No, I don't think so. Because I think that in it, it, it that theme, that evocative theme, if you will, um, has come up in other things that I've been reading. I think every single book is unique. But I, I am fascinated that it feels to me like several of, several of us are going at this key theme from very different angles. So I love mm -hmm. that that is a, a part of your theme. Very much life unexpected, I think, was when I was reading yes. your book. It felt very much like life unexpected. And you do such a beautiful job in the beginning of this very staid, perfect life where they're setting the um, garden party is the example. It's a graduation, I believe. Mm -hmm. But there's this beautiful sense of um, properness and place. And then you've got this wonderful character, Serafina, who just oh, keeps she's my favorite. She, oh, she totally keeps it real for me. Isn't she hilarious? Yeah. She's my comic relief. 
She is. She just keeps it really, really wonderful. So in the development of this book, you, you were you on a certain trajectory? Did you have to leave anything go at the end? Were there characters that you may have loved? You just said you love Serafina as I did. Were there characters that you had to let go of to get your final project? There really weren't. Um, I had... Uh... I did add a few that I think really enhanced the story, um, such as Henri, the French baker, um, who, uh, when, when Dare gets to know him, she really, that's a growth marker for her when she experiences an evening with Henri. Wonderful. There's so much in your novel. It's very, very rich. And there's so much in your life as author. Can we talk a little bit about the importance of author community, particularly the Women's Fiction Writers Association, which I'm a member of and you're a member of? Yes. I um, am not as active there as I would like to be, but find it such a valuable resource. And you were director of craft education. Can you explain to listeners what that means? Yes, I um, I found my way through that. I was asked to do that, and um, I had only been a member like a year, and I was asked to do that. And I think they've consolidated some of those roles in into one now. But I was um, in charge of the well was also a webinar host before. Lisa Montanero, who is incredible at it so much. She's added so very much to that. Um, she is just phenomenal um, because I'm much more of an introvert than she is. Mm -hmm. And um, so I learned about, I scheduled um, and found people um, who could bring to the show um, knowledge of different elements of the craft and uh, also uh, wrote a uh, long range um, plan for craft education that was very difficult, but Lainey Cameron championed me through that. And um, as far as the elements of craft, um, that really helped me learn them by learning about them, it helped me to use them in the right ways. Um, I learned how to pace. I learned um, um, plotting. Um, I, I go by a very simple line graph um, in which I come to the, uh, I have my total of 90,000 words always. And I make my quarter mark, half mark, three quarter mark, and make those the plot points that I have to reach a certain page um, by the time I'm at those points. Um, and then there's, uh, there's, I mean, there's so much more. Um, remind me, I'm freezing <laughs> up here. <laughs> no, you're absolutely fine. I think that it is such a process. Some people are plotters. Some people are what we call pantsers who write much but more by the seat of their pants. I'm kind of in between. And I think we find that. And you mentioned Lainey Cameron. She couldn't be more of a champion of all authors, oh, particularly. she's been amazing. She's absolutely an amazing partner in all of our work. It's interesting to me, as I do storytellers and Author Talk Network and a few other things that I'm involved in, some people very much are studying the art of craft and some people don't. I'm somebody who actually doesn't study craft as much, but I'm becoming increasingly, even though I have four books out, I'm increasingly um, fascinated by craft and pacing. So I'm hoping my work gets better through things like Women's Fiction Writers Association and learning from you and others. I've, I've been a successful author and, and grateful for that. But I mm -hmm. think that it is, if you're a serious author, we really do need to take the art of that um, very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and it is keeping, an art. It is. And keeping that story, of course, center. So well, you Donald, do... I'm sorry. Ahead. Donald mm -hmm. Ma's books. Have you read them? I've not. Um, you must. Um, okay. Writing your breakthrough novel was, I firmly believe, the one that landed me my agent. Although I've since um, kind of let her go. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that, that novel um, is amazing. He has so many examples and applications. And then I bought the emotional craft of fiction that I intend to read before I write my next book. 
um, of his, and then he has several. Okay. Well, we all get better at our craft, no matter how many books we have. So you do such a variety of things within our author community. You host a podcast, you head Four Eyes Editorial, you head um, Evocative Publishing. Would you talk about each of those things and why they're important to you as an author? Well, yes. Um, I, the Four Eyes Editorial, is that one you mentioned? Yes. My editorial side hustle. Um, I have loved doing that. I haven't done a lot of it lately, but I've loved doing that because I get to work with other authors and share my ideas for how they can um, make their work more evocative or um, learn great sentence structure or, you know, the, the length of sentences. And I really... Um, because that's my gift. That's, I don't do developmental edits. Mm -hmm. I do, um, I, I prefer to work with beginning authors who are not yet, um, using prose and evocative language and, uh, working with transitions. Um, so that's who I prefer to work with. And it's just been a, a real joy. I've, I've had some great clients. So you do that. Now you have evocative um, publishing where you are a publishing oh, house. Okay. So Christina Pero, hi, Christina out there. Um, she is this um, whippersnapper, 29 year old entrepreneur, author of the, the novel Lucky that is so original and so genre breaking. Um, it's an amazing book. And we became friends um, when um, just online. And she approached me about designing my cover for Topanga Canyon because, I mean, she's just, she can do everything. She's incredible. And she wanted me to be her guinea pig. And I said, yes, she gave me a great price. And it just, it just, it's a fabulous out. cover. So gorgeous in my opinion. It's a beautiful cover. Yeah. Here's one. If you have it, seen it see me posting it everywhere <laughs> it's a fabulous cover yeah in the back and there is the best um thread of a storyline um throughout the book having to do with sunflowers and i didn't even tell her that about the sunflower element and she put sunflowers on that cover well, it was meant. It was meant to be. It was. So, how did you partner with her in terms of evocative publishing? Okay, so um, thank you. You did ask me that. Um, Christina has developed her own publishing entity called Logos, L O G O S, mm -hmm. and it means it has like a butterfly shape to it, but it has all these cool vibe meanings to mm -hmm. it. And she um, did made her own publishing entity. And I thought, well, now how you can't, um, you can be your own publisher and, you know, have full um, rights to all of your, have full rights to your work. But, you know, you have to have a publisher. So, I mean, a, pardon me, a printer. So she said print through Ingram Sparks or Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, which I did, but then you are the, um, publishing entity. And I went ahead and got an LLC. So mm -hmm. it's Evocative Publishing LLC. Wonderful. And it's all so mine. It is all yours. There's so many paths to publishing today from indie to hybrid to people starting their own presses. And I think that what's really important at the core of it is the telling of a good story. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot believe our time together is already over today. So I wanted to just Thank you for being guest number 50 on the Storytellers. And any, 50. thank you. Any closing comments you would like to make, Elizabeth? Well, you, uh, you had said, you had mentioned that we might, um, you might ask me something about a, a special quirk of mine. And I was going to tell you that I use every day when I'm working, I use um, my favorite coffee, a favorite coffee cup. And I got these all through from, um, anthropology a few years ago. Oh, sure. And they're all special and they all have a special message. And so if I break them, I'm going to die because 
they, you know, they don't make them anymore. But do your best was the one I chose for today. And then um, I have one that says make it happen that I like to use when I'm really facing a task that um, requires a lot of thought and effort. Well, you did fabulously today, so that mug would work. And you also just brought us so much joy here on The Storyteller. So, Elizabeth, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Grace. It was wonderful. Thank you. This has been a copyrighted episode of The Storytellers by Grace Salmon and Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. It is episode 50. I am going on hiatus for a couple of weeks. I will be back in August with both The Storytellers and a new show called Launchpad. Thanks for being with us today. That concludes this episode of The Storytellers. I'm so glad you could be part of the story today. I hope you share the stories, tell your own, and come back for another episode. Because when our stories are told, everything changes. I'm Grace Salmon.